Tensions between the BRICS countries and Western powers led by the United States have reached a boiling point. Are we in a high-stakes showdown that threatens global stability? This alarming escalation is most evident in the world's vital trade routes, now the front line of an intense planetary game of risk. Sir Harfold Jama Kinder, a founding figure in geopolitics, theorized that land connectivity and control of communication routes are critical in shaping the world's geopolitical framework. Therefore, the development of transportation infrastructure could enable one or more nations to rapidly extend their influence through these new routes. So, the connection projects that are being created all over the world, in particular in the Eurasian bloc, take on a role of extraordinary relevance in the international context, especially in promoting the development of relations between the countries involved. These projects are gaining significant importance on an international level and this could have serious implications for global balance and power dynamics. Let's therefore go straight to the heart of the global chaos. We are all now aware of the recent Yemeni attacks against oil tankers and container ships in the Red Sea to counter Israel's bloody war against Gaza. What emerges if we broaden our vision of the problem is that these attacks have dramatically revealed the critical significance of trade routes in the unstable balance of international geopolitics. A long-neglected topic which nevertheless emerges as a dominant force in the strategies of world powers. Witness the rapid intervention of the United States and other Western nations, a desperate move to safeguard the passage of ships. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. We are revealing the broader and more intense conflict simmering between the West and the BRICS nations. A confrontation taking place across multiple geographic and socio-economic battlefields. Today it will be a worldwide exploration aiming to provide a comprehensive understanding of these complex dynamics. While each segment deserves its own coverage, we will be extremely precise in our analysis, filling every moment with crucial insights. So, we need to rewind the tape for at least a few months to better understand the scenario we are getting into and how the BRICS are key players for better or worse in what is happening today. The first sign that trade corridors would be a hot topic soon came during the BRICS summit in South Africa from Russian President Putin who, in his welcome speech to the new BRICS members, had proposed the establishment of a BRICS Permanent Transport Commission that would be one of the focal projects under Russia's BRICS presidency in 2024. Я уже говорил об актуальности ускоренного развития трансконтинентальных маршрутов, таких как коридор Север-Юг, который соединит российские порты в Северных морях и Балтике с морскими терминалами и побережья на побережье Персидского залива и Индийского океана. И в будущем сможет обеспечить ежегодный транзит до 30 миллионов тонн грузов. Считаем, что пришло время учредить в рамках БРИКС постоянно действующую комиссию по транспорту, которая занялась бы не только проектом Север-Юг, но и в более широком плане вопросами развития логистических и транспортных коридоров, межрегиональных и глобальных. В случае согласия партнеров, российская сторона могла бы отработать эту идею в рамках председательства в БРИКС в 2024 году. It is worth mentioning which are the new member countries – Iran, UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. So, it is clear the influence BRICS can have from the Indian Ocean to the Persian Gulf, especially on the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. On the Red Sea, the reasoning can be even broader because a new member country is Ethiopia, which as of August had no outlet to the sea, but an this is a topic on which we will certainly do a specific video. 
which currently has entered into a controversial agreement with the separatist region of Somaliland that has granted it a 50-year contract to exploit the port of Berbera, right at the entrance to the Red Sea. In addition, although Argentina decided not to join the BRICS after the recent presidential election, it is clear how strategically important it could have been in maritime transit in the far south of the world. At the time, this proposal passed almost under the radar as a purely commercial matter. But this was certainly not the case for the US government, which a couple of weeks later in India during the G20 presented with great emphasis the IMEC Corridor Project, the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. To be precise, we should say represented, because it was already being talked about in 2018. Work to address infrastructure gaps across low middle income countries. We need to maximize the impacts of our investments. That's why a few months ago I announced that the United States will work with our partners to invest in economic corridors. In practice, it means we're focusing on regional infrastructure projects that deliver results across multiple countries and in multiple sectors. What are the special features of this project? First of all, the participating nations. India, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, three BRICS countries then, Israel and the European community. And here already one should wonder why this project should be sponsored by the US, which is on the other side of the world. But each of you can answer as you see fit. But we are obviously malicious and therefore want to think that this interest is aimed at destabilizing other projects and especially other political balances. In fact, IMEC can be seen as a challenge to China's Belt and Road Initiative, the ambitious infrastructure network that China has been investing in around the world for years, and to the North-South Corridor, the INSCC, a multimodal network of sea, rail and road routes between India, Iran, Afghanistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia, Central Asia, and before the sanctions against Russia, Europe as well. Are you starting to see the bigger picture? It's important to know the significant role of Israel, especially its leader, Netanyahu. During the United Nations Assembly on September 22, he announced the IMEC corridor. He described it as the largest cooperation project in our history that will transform the Middle East and Israel and benefit everyone globally. However, there have been recent concerns about the map shown by Netanyahu in that speech because it did not include Gaza. Was this an oversight? For those interested in contentious topics and conjecture, the Ben Gurion Canal issue might pique your interest. Recently brought back into the spotlight due to Israel's latest conflict with Hamas, this historic proposed waterway in Israel seeks to connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea through the southern end of the Gulf of Aqaba. This ambitious project aims to tackle water scarcity and environmental issues while simultaneously establishing a new maritime route and enhancing tourism opportunities. Have you heard about it? What's your opinion on it? We don't want to get into those discussions, but it seemed right to mention them. The resurgence of the IMEC project has sparked both excitement and disputes, including from countries like Turkey, which perceives this initiative as a potential threat to its trade routes to Europe. Iran, on the other hand, insists that excluding a route through its territory would be not convenient. Some Western analysts believe that even before the Gaza war outbreak, the US strategy for regional economic integration failed to achieve its main objective, mitigating Chinese influence in the Middle East. Therefore, it's suggested that the India-Middle East-Europe economic corridor may be insufficient and late in execution. However, Russian President Vladimir Putin, during his address at the 8th Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok on September 12, 
expressed a contrasting viewpoint. He asserted that the IMEC would not adversely affect Russia. Instead, it would prove beneficial for the country. If the situation seemed complicated to you before the outbreak of the war in Gaza, let alone now that we have the US and the UK launching strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen and cargo ships that are shifting transit routes to circumnavigate the African continent, according to some, taking the world back 200 years, raising the cost of goods and supply times too. Again, it should be noted that these ships on this route call at a BRICS country, namely South Africa. We will come back to Africa in a moment because there is an issue that has entered the news these days that needs to be addressed. The Northern Sea Route. We are talking about a shipping lane along Russia's Arctic coast, offering a shorter passage between Europe and Asia compared to traditional routes through the Suez Canal. After the Houthi army attacked Israel-linked ships and cargo in the Red Sea once again, Russian President Vladimir Putin said, the Northern Sea Route is becoming more efficient for transporting goods than the Suez Canal. The economy of the movement of goods increases from time to time there. The Northern Sea Road is increasingly being opened to ships at different seasons of the year, but the icebreaker fleet will be needed for a long time to come, Putin noted. The fleet of nuclear-powered icebreakers will definitely be needed for more than a decade, and this represents a great competitive advantage for our country, he added. Russia has a fleet of more than 40 nuclear-powered icebreakers, making it the predominant country on the North Pole shipping lanes, much more than Canada and especially the United States. And guess what suddenly happened after Putin's statement? So here is the scoop. On December 19th, the US Department of State dropped the coordinates that mark out the outer limits of America's continental shelf in areas more than 200 nautical miles from shore, what they call the extended continental shelf. Think of it as an underwater extension of country's land territory. Basically, Uncle Sam is staking a claim on parts of the seabed in both the Bering and Beaufort seas. These spots are right next to Russia's economic zone, which was outlined by an agreement back in 1990s between the US and the USSR, also known as the baker shevardnadze line. But Russia hasn't ratified it yet. The strategic importance of the region, especially its proximity to the Northern Sea Route, is a primary factor in these claims. The US is already taking steps to strengthen its position in the Arctic, such as developing Starlink GSS infrastructure for military and Coast Guard use. Future plans may include restoring a petrol air base on Adak Island and intensifying military training in the region. The Aleut Corporation, representing local landowners, has expressed interest in selling the idea of creating an Arctic port on the island to Washington. I don't know about you, but Russia saw this move as a big threat to the stability of that area. Nikolai Haritonov, head of the State Duma Committee on the Arctic, stated, Unilateral border expansion on the Arctic is unacceptable and can only lead to increased tensions. First of all, it is necessary to prove the geological ownership of these territories, as the Russian Federation has done in its time, which has gathered a large evidence base with the help of underwater vehicles. The Russian request for the platform was reviewed by a United Nations subcommittee. The United States, on the other hand, has not ratified the law of the Sea Convention. Exactly. While the US is following the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea guidelines, they haven't officially ratified the treaty. This makes you wonder about their position in making or challenging extended continental shelf claims. Well, let's not get into who's right or wrong in this argument, all right? We would need a deep dive analysis for that and it will eat up time we could use exploring article stuff. But well, 
Isn't the timing of some actions here just a bit off? What's your take on this? We made a promise to return to Africa because the African continent is shaking things up like never before. Western countries with Uncle Sam leading the Congo line are losing their popularity contest against China and Russia. That's what happens when you have played Monopoly with real territories and populations for years. The Lobito Corridor project is a US initiative aimed at countering China's Belt and Road Initiative in Africa. It focuses on improving transportation infrastructure, particularly at Trans-African Railway and Road Network. The goal is to connect the Atlantic coast of Angola to the Tanzanian port of Dar es Salaam, facilitating trade across Africa. The project is part of the U.S. strategy to increase its influence and economic ties in the region as an alternative to China's infrastructure projects. The corridor involves Angola, Zambia and the Democratic Republic of Congo and will serve as a crucial trade route for transporting critical minerals used in electric vehicles and wind turbines. The three countries plan to harmonize regulations and develop infrastructure for these projects as part of the South African development community. A significant challenge the US is countering lies in the established infrastructure and diplomatic influence that China has already secured through its initiative. To overcome this, the US must foster trust and carefully navigate geopolitical intricacies and historical relationships within the region. The success of this project hinges on the U.S.'s engagement with African nations, respecting their sovereignty and interests while providing tangible benefits that align with their goals. This task is made more complex due to China's formidable presence in Africa. The financial challenges currently faced by Beijing present new opportunities for the United States, Europe and G7 countries to narrow the gap. But don't get too excited. Even with the US trying to balance out China's overseas development funding, it's doubtful that a deepened project financing will let the West jump ahead in infrastructure projects. Especially considering African countries are pretty set on building and keeping value right at home. Well, quite a mess, isn't it? And we have only scratched the surface of each scenario. I hope you are not tired yet because we have to deal with the last part of the story involving Latin America. Take your favorite drink, by the way. While the expansion of the BRICS group has certainly angered Washington, where historical allies such as Egypt, Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are allied with Russia, China and Iran, the fear of losing control of crucial areas such as the Middle East is very high. Not to mention important trade routes such as the Suez Canal. Yes, even there, in what was once the backyard of the United States, China is increasing its influence not only over the Panama Canal, but over all of Latin America where another BRICS country, Brazil, is located. In 1999, Panama transferred the administration of the Panama Canal from the United States to Panama and granted Chinese company Hutchison Wampur the rights to manage its ports, making a significant shift in global trade dynamics. This move allowed China to exert considerable control over this vital waterway, strategically positioning itself in global commerce. China's influence in the region further increased as it became a primary trade partner for the canal, second only to the United States. A pivotal moment occurred in 2017 when Panama officially recognized the People's Republic of China, cutting diplomatic ties with Taiwan. This decision was part of China's strategy to isolate Taiwan internationally and expand its influence in Latin America. The United States responded to China's growing presence with efforts like Mike Pompeo's 2018 visit to Panama City, cautioning against China's economic strategies. This growing Chinese involvement in Central America has broader implications. Following Panama's lead, 
countries like the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua also shifted their recognition from Taiwan to China. This trend raises concerns about the spread of anti-Western sentiment in a region traditionally under U.S. influence. The expulsion of Taiwan from the Central American Parliament symbolizes a shift away from democratic alliances, highlighting China's increasing geopolitical influence and presenting both economic opportunities and security challenges in the Americas. Were you aware of this context? This other piece of the puzzle will help to get a clearer vision of the entire picture. Of course, there are several projects to find a valid alternative to the Panama Canal. The most relevant are the Bioceanic Corridor and Interoceanic Corridor of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. But even with those two, things will not be easy. The Bioceanic Corridor is a major infrastructure project in South America. Its geopolitical implications, particularly involving China, Bolivia, Brazil, and the United States. This route running through Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, and Chile aims to shift this dynamic by reducing dependence on the Panama Canal, thereby diminishing U.S. influence in the region. China plays a significant role in this shift. Initially, Bolivia, with Chinese financing, planned to develop a rail network connecting Brazil to Peru. However, due to international challenges, and external frictions, Bolivia's project did not materialize, leading Paraguay to propose an alternative route, effectively sidelining Bolivia. This new route, primarily a road corridor, promises to enhance South American integration and reduce trade distances to Asian markets, particularly benefiting Brazil's agricultural experts. Brazil stands to gain considerably from this corridor as it will provide more direct access to Asian markets, especially for its soybean and maize experts. This development could potentially boost Brazil's economy, particularly in regions like Mato Grosso. The U.S. traditionally dominant in the region faces a challenge to its influence due to this corridor. China's involvement in South American infrastructure, including the Bioceanic Corridor, signifies a growing Chinese presence in what has been considered the U.S.'s sphere of influence. This shift reflects a broader trend of decreasing U.S. engagement in the region and increasing Chinese economic involvement, potentially reshaping geopolitical alignments in South America. Mexico has also initiated a project for the interoceanic corridor of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, an alternative to Panama that could also end up in the BRICS orbit. And perhaps this is one of the reasons behind the strong pressure exerted by the United States on Mexico within weeks of the start of the BRICS summit proceedings in South Africa. Indeed, up to that point, Mexico had expressed a strong interest in joining the BRICS, only to change its mind radically within a few weeks. For those interested in this story, we have analyzed the issue in more detail in this video. As we close today's eye-opening journey, it is clear that the stakes are higher than ever. The role of BRICS nations in shaping our global destiny cannot be overstated. Are we on the brink of significant geopolitical shifts? How will these powers influence the delicate balance of international relations? The answers to these questions are crucial, and the time to pay attention is now. Don't just watch history unfold, be a part of the conversation. Hit like, share your thoughts, and subscribe for more updates. Together, let's stay ahead of the curve in these stormy times. Thanks for watching.